Hi, I'm Phil Webb, Principal Consultant with Select Business Solutions. In this module, we'll be examining the techniques available in the Unified Modelling Language, or UML, for the modelling of information, concentrating specifically on the static elements of systems, rather than the behavioural. However, before we delve into the details of concepts and notations, it's important that we spend some time understanding the background to the UML, both in terms of the historical development of software modelling and of the specific efforts which combined to form the UML. As described in the sessions on the development and history of software processes and tools in the module on the evolution of software, prior to the 1970s, the analysis of computer software systems had primarily taken the form of textual, functional descriptions and requirements. Some 20 to 30 years of software development had proceeded without a formal approach to the process of developing the software. The difficulties faced in this period were no different to those faced today. As the size and complexity of systems increased, it became more and more difficult to define clearly what was required of them and also to understand their structure and behaviour. This led in the 1970s to a range of formal notations for systems analysis and design, allowing the system and its environment to be represented at a high level, a contextual view, which could then be decomposed into increasingly detailed views. Two key men drove this effort, Larry Constantine and Ed Jordan, who summed up their approach in their Structured Design, Fundamentals of a Discipline of Computer Program and System Design. Our approach to Structured Design is based on a formal, though not as yet mathematical, theory of the complexity of computer systems and programs. In our view, the cost of systems development is a function of problem and program complexity, as measured in terms of human error. For a given problem, the human error production and therefore the cost of coding, debugging, maintenance and modification are minimised when the problem is subdivided into the smallest functional units that can be treated independently. The work of Constantine, Jordan and others led to the development of the Structured Analysis and Design Methodology, SSADM, in the UK from about 1980 onwards. An interesting aspect of the development of SSADM is that it's a combination of a number of different notations and techniques, formally bringing together those ideas which had been developed over a number of years. You'll shortly see parallels in the, in the development of the unified modelling language. You can find out more about SSADM in the module on conventional methods of software engineering. The techniques it formalised are still important in a number of engineering fields to this day. During the 1980s, around the time that SSADM was beginning to gain wider acceptance, there came an increasing development and adoption of object-oriented programming languages. These languages allowed a software engineer to express the real world of objects more easily in the system, and therefore over a number of years, they've progressed to become the predominant form of language for computer systems development. However, the conventional methods such as SSADM were unable to reflect these new object paradigms as well as they had the modular approaches of previous language concepts. And as a result, a number of new techniques started to emerge. Three techniques and methods in particular emerged. The Object Modelling Technique, or OMT, developed by James Rumba and colleagues at General Electric Research in the late 1980s and early 90s. Grady Booch's Booch Method and Ivar Jakobsen's Object Oriented Software Engineering Method. By 1995, Rational had brought together the men behind these three techniques through the hiring of Rumba from General Electric in 1994 and the acquisition of Jakobsen's company, Objectory, in 1995. In 1996, Rational then tasked the Three Amigos, as they became known, with the development of a non-proprietary unified modelling language, which was submitted to and adopted by the Object Management Group, or OMG, in 1997. 
The UML then is influenced by elements of Rumba, Booch and Jakobsen's work and combines notational concepts of each of their techniques into a formal standard which has now been adopted across much of the industry. The UML continues to be developed and enhanced and has received a number of major updates and additions in the 10 plus years since its adoption. Alongside the development of the UML as a standard, many computer-aided software engineering or CASE tool vendors have developed software to aid software engineers in their efforts to describe the systems they develop. Rational gained prominence in part due to the key role played by their employees in the definition of the UML, but many other vendors have provided tools which have followed closely the advances made in the modelling of object-oriented systems and indeed have contributed to their further development. Select Business Solutions, or its precursor Select Software Tools, has worked alongside Rational, now owned by IBM, and others to continue the progression of a number of modelling standards, including the UML. And in this video module, we'll represent some of the notational aspects of UML using Select's business system and database modelling tool, Select Architect. In this module, we'll concentrate on the use of the unified modelling language to represent a system's information structure, leaving the behavioural aspects of the system to another module. We'll look almost exclusively at the use of class diagrams, and through the course of the module, we'll introduce the concepts and elements which may be used to describe this static representation of a system. First, we'll consider the concept of classification, initially looking at how humans naturally group objects into classes which share the same characteristics and behaviour, and then at how UML describes these same concepts in modelling notation. In the session on attributes and operations, we look in detail at how we model the characteristics and behaviour of a class, identifying the properties that may be used to describe them and how their visual representation varies according to the values of those properties. Objects would have limited use if they could not refer to other objects, so the session on dependency and association helps us to understand the provision made in UML for modelling the relationships between classes, which result in links between objects. The various types of relationship will be examined in depth, and we'll highlight the notational specifics of each. Much of the strength of object-oriented techniques is in the capability of a class to act as the parent of another. Inheritance is covered in a further session in which we explore some simple techniques to identify class hierarchies during system analysis and look at the importance of abstract classes and abstract operations in defining partial implementations and of interfaces for subsequent subclasses to implement. In the final main session of the module, we consider one of the ultimate goal, goals of model information in UML, to define a database schema. We look at the mismatches that exist between an object-oriented structure and the relational model applied by most database management systems today. We will identify a number of strategies by which these mismatches can be overcome and talk about tools which can help to apply this mapping. We'll begin then by examining the concept of classification, the grouping of related objects into classes. <laughs> 